Thank you so much for your kind words and for a lovely introduction. Um, the title of my talk is uh, Towards Religious Citizenship and Inclusion, Challenging Patriarchal Able-Bodied Interpretations of Religion. Um, today's talk is based on um, my book, which was based on research with British Muslim mothers of disabled children and young people. Between 2013 and 2016, I interviewed a British Pakistani woman with disabled children and young people. Part of the reason why I'm focusing today on uh, the role that religion plays in British Muslim lives and British families is because uh, existing literature portrays provisions and um, existing literature uh, existing literature portrays religion as a very static category within within um, within UK within, within the lives of British Muslim families and one that acts as a hindrance to the experiences of provisions that disabled families can utilize. There is literature on how religious and cultural barriers prevent Muslim communities from utilizing existing services and provisions because they're not appropriate or uh, they're in conflict with their religious identity. So I'm also aware that discussing paternalistic interpretations within Islam, in particular to a Western audience, uh, risk viewing this issue through a West versus Islam lens. Um, but I would encourage my audience to think about the common issues, commonalities that exist across different religions uh, when talking about disability. So I want to focus on three aspects today of my talk. First, I wanna discuss uh, with the audience how religious citizenship for disabled children is exercised by able-bodied Muslim mothers. Second, um, I want to talk about how gendered care of disabled children perpetuates ableism and patriarchy. And finally, I want to look at how children and young people's sexual and gender rights need to be addressed within a religious context. So when we talk of religious citizenship, um, uh, it is quite, I, I, I want to disclose to the audience that I, when I was collecting this data with, with the mothers and I was having conversations, I was not particularly focused on uh, asking their opinion about religious citizenship. Um, I was actually just looking at through from an intersectional lens and it was really much dependent on how the mothers were leading these conversations and what they decided to talk and share with me. I was interested in how disabled children and young people experience young, um, both the public and private spaces. There was this realization during these conversations that the degree to which one experiences religious citizenship or Muslimness is tied to patriarchal notions of caring responsibilities. I elaborate on this um, now. So even though Islam, like all other religions, a lot of religions actually, views disability as a natural part of human nature and emphasizes the role of care for disabled people. The understanding of care as a rights-based perspective is often only applied or paid attention to an older population. Hence, the notion of care as rights to dignity for old people can be typically seen within the context of obligations uh, that children have towards their parents. Within a South Asian context, you can see that care is also culturally interpreted as a woman's domain. Hence, you see um, daughter-in-laws and daughters doing the care work for aging disabled parents. This care is closely aligned with principles of one's duty towards a disabled person, rights and dignity of the disabled person and fairness in the conduct. In the context of young people and um, young uh, and children, the care is typically conceptualized within the duties of the uh, of the parents for for towards their children. There is less focus of agency uh, of the person, um, and this is because of the position that children and young people occupy in religious text, which situates parents as guardians of their children in all respects. Um, the expression "feeble-minded" uh, or "weak-minded" is 
often used to describe very young children who do not know what is in their best interest. And this is tied to the religious um, notion of when a child reaches the age of maturity or puberty, um, being bale, which denotes that young people have reached a biological milestone where they can have, uh, where they have developed the capacity to operate independently and according to societal norms. Muslim jurisprudence from across various schools of thought agree that those rulings that govern the obligations and responsibilities of children who have not yet reached the age of maturity can also be applied to people with disability. Hence, the position of both groups, that is people with disability and children and young people, uh, is judged to be on the similar grounds uh, from a religious point of view. That is, both groups lack the capacity to reason or rationality for themselves. There's also consensus among jurists from all schools of thought, all Muslims um, um, that uh, Muslim thought that individuals with intellectual disabilities are tasked with less religious obligations. As a rule, the less intellectual capacities that one possesses, the less religious obligations they're asked to perform. And this is highlighted in Ghali's paper on the question of legal capacity and focus. This is uh, concerning because it represents experiences of disability to one's proximity to able-bodiedness, rather than focusing on how religion can be practiced, experienced, imagined in new accessible and radical ways. In the context of disabled children and young people, it also creates a tension between um, parenting obligations and children's right to practice their own citizenship. On one hand, you can claim that Islam is very accessible to disabled groups by ensuring their adjustments and accommodations and how one goes about fulfilling religious obligations and day-to-day -day affairs. Um, and yet, on the other hand, the religious interpretations can uh, impose an almost ableist infantilizing lens when it comes to viewing the rights of disabled children and young people as their rights seem to be viewed as a static and almost fixed notion of disability. It is rooted in that belief that children and more specifically disabled children and young people do not know their own good, cannot differentiate between good and bad due to their disability and therefore uh, require parents to fulfill on their behalf how they want to religiously participate. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that um, when we talk about parenting and specifically with, with regards to religious values, um, this, this could be something that could be observed within able-bodied families, with able-bodied children as well. So, um, but there is an added perspective of um, an infantilizing, almost paternalistic lens. I do want to, for, for my talk, focus on um, direct quotes that have been shared by the mothers in my research, because I think I'm a qualitative person, and I think these quotes do capture uh, more accurately um, the kind of sentiment I want to communicate to the audience. So Maham is uh, a mother of, when I interviewed her, she, she, she was a mother of a seven-year-old child uh, with um, global developmental um, delay. And she was talking about religious obligations and religious responsibilities. Um, and we reached a point in conversation where she was like, I don't want my child to worry about this. Uh, we are a Muslim family, but I, I want to do all of those things for him. I, I don't think he, he understands. Um, the quote begins, and in case um, um, I'm going to read out the quote over here, it says, there's no need to consult or even discuss about whether Daniel um, will learn or not when he doesn't even have basic understanding of life. I mean, how can you teach him? End quote. <clears throat> so uh, here's another quote that another mom shared with me, and this is uh, from... Um, I think her child was at the time 15 years old. He has a life limiting condition. And um, she was talking about how decisions around his religiosity, his Muslimness, his Muslim identity have to be performed, have to be done through her. So this is the quote where she says, his religious responsibilities, he doesn't have any because religious responsibilities are only binding on those who've got some understanding 
you can't put religious obligations on these kind of children, end quote. So in Islamic scholarship and within day-to-day -day experiences, there is an absence of the disabled child and young person's point of view about their own religious rights and identity. So to imagine a new ontological meaning of what it means to be a Muslim in a non-able-bodied way, we would need disabled individuals to be fully agentic in that process in determining which elements of their religious identity they want to keep, they want to um, you know, hold, hold on to, um, and that are compatible with all their positionalities, all their experiences, and which parts of their religious identity they want to let go, as opposed to that decision being made for them as an act of leniency or compassion, which in this case um, is being made by the mothers. What was happening in my participants' life was that mothers were actively performing religious duties on behalf of their children, which Islam allows for certain acts such as zakat, which is charity on behalf of someone else or complete absolving of prayers, namaz, salat. It can be argued that mothers did this because they wanted their children to have a religious identity. However, this participation by proxy intersected with patriarchal structures and gendered labor meaning those um, acts which did not require any additional physical labor such as giving charity, which could be more readily performed compared to those that entailed a further physical labor such as fasting. So mothers would have to fast, therefore, you know, they could easily, um, they could make that decision of not fasting because it required something from, uh, from their, um, you know, uh, labor. More importantly, notions of what their children can and cannot do uh, were embedded in problematic conceptualization of disability as a fixed phase of innocence that requires legal guardians to act on their behalf. This was reflected in uh, mother's interviews where mother suggested having a disabled child meant the child would not have to face or experience aspects of British culture, which conflicted with their parenting and Islamic values or cultural values. So for instance, not worrying about uh, your child having a girlfriend or hanging out in pubs, not having their parenting rules questioned or challenged as it would be in the case of able-bodied children. This is quite a delicate matter because here you do have to wonder if Muslim parents are not allowed to create and reinforce their religious values and beliefs within their personal homes, then where else can they practice their religious identity? And this is a very delicate point of you know, issue because you have to uh, address ableism. You have to talk about a paternalistic lens within typical parenting models. But at the same time, you have to also understand that British Muslim families uh, live in UK society where their parenting practices, where everything, every aspect of their life is heavily scrutinized. Um, and they're already a marginalized group within British society. Um, any, any kind of you know, public attention uh, and they're always demonized in, in, in different ways. So it is important to recognize that religious paternalistic lens is is, might not just be specific to Islam, but also applicable to other religions and that this issue needs to be addressed by including um, voices and, and concerns of disabled uh, individuals. My second focus is on how gendered care of disabled children perpetuates ableism and patriarchy. Caring in, in general is gendered with a majority of caring responsibilities performed by mothers across different communities. Um, this may be due to society devaluing and invisibilizing the care that is necessary for fulfilling the rights and entitlement of disabled people and also a general state disregard for women's childcare labor. However, there are significant differences from an intersectional point of view. For instance, in 2017, Fossil Society published a report that suggested that compared to 6% of British white women, 30% of British Pakistani and Bangladeshi women do unpaid child care. Now, this disparity could be a consequence of several factors, not just one. For instance, patriarchal elements of British South Asian culture coupled with lack of access to adequate formal uh, support systems and information that could help minoritized women supplement their um, caring responsibilities at home. In the context of disabilities, uh, disability, different studies also point to the 
uh, issue of lack of same-sex carers in faith-based communities when access, uh, accessing provisions. Um, and the findings from such important studies have actually helped uh, deliver and shape culturally competent services in some areas. But in the context of, um, again, con you know, if you look at the last 12 years of austerity and cutbacks and uh, cutbacks in welfare services, um, it is not consistent, you know, to expect to have uh, culturally competent services across different, um, different regions in, in the UK. The lack of same-sex carers um, did help to explain the gendered care involved for some of my participants. Uh, I'm going to read out this quote for you from Maria again. Um, she has two children with disability, one who is at that time when I was interviewing, he was 15 years old and he has a life threatening and life limiting condition. Um, and someone uh, and Maria also had a younger daughter um, who was at that time, I think eight months or six months old. Um, and she also has the same condition. The quote begins with, Amir goes to play schemes and respite. I don't know if I can leave someone um, her youngest daughter who's also disabled. If I leave the girls with people who I don't know, then I don't think my husband would be too happy with that. I will be the sole carer for her then. I don't know, we, we just have to take that step when we come to it, end quote. Um, Maria did not mind female carers for her son, Amir, but for her youngest daughter, she knew that her husband would refuse respite care if the carer was male. Although uh, Maria's husband was hands on at home. He had very long working hours as a taxi driver. And Maria told me that when her husband would be home, they would share the responsibilities. And oftentimes her spouse would be the one providing her the necessary respite. Most of the physical care though, for Saman and Amir were carried out by Maria. And this involved changing, feeding, bathing, physiotherapy at home. And she reflected that with the nonstop care and caregiving responsibilities and duties for Saman and Amir, her other three children had learned to mother themselves and become young carers for, her, for, their church, for their siblings. While she was able to get some respite for Amir, her husband was um, uncomfortable with, with their daughter being looked after by respite carers. She acknowledged how his preconceptions of what is appropriate and appropriate parenting was influenced by rigid cultural views. But she also recognized that the extent of his you know, practical and emotional support was largely dependent on how his own labor was set out in a, in a capitalist structure. The fact that immigrant and minoritized communities must often work low paying jobs with low or odd working, long or odd working hours in effect, becoming less visible within their own family space, ultimately results in physical care being gendered within home. Um, and perhaps wider patriarchal structures, capitalist, you know, uh, patriarchal structures introduce and reinforce uh, family cultural patriarchy uh, of uh, patriarchal structures, even when families want to resist themselves. It is plausible that in the future, Maria's husband will be less keen on carers for his daughter, but this consequently puts the extra burden of care on Maria. Um, and however, she would also experience the loss of her spouse being present at home because he is the main breadwinner in the family um, that exploits uh, the precarity of his labor. Uh, you know, he's, he's situated in that kind of a society, society. Here's another quote from Kiran and she, she used to, she was uh, at the time of the interview, she was working as a part-time school administrator in a primary school and her husband was working full-time at a pharmacy and they had a 16 year old um, boy. And um, I think, um, and again, uh, you know, she's talking about the responsibilities and the caregiving responsibilities that she has to do. So the quote begins, my husband probably wouldn't like me saying this, but I feel like I'm a single parent because mind you, he does work long hours. I mean, on Mondays he's gone by nine and doesn't come back until half past eight. You know, everything is done by then. She loves. So I feel I've done everything. You know, Ahmed has had his bath, he's in pajamas, and he's just brushed his teeth, and I've just put him to bed. That's about it. End quote. So when we look at Kiran's experience, again, we have to also think about labor market conditions are such that Kiran's husband uh, must work long and odd hours. And yet, the fact is that the family cannot function on their husband's income alone, like Maria. Uh, Kiran's quality of life. Uh, 
was affected, leaving her feeling overworked and exhausted. Kiran was not resentful towards her husband. And I think this is the most important thing to realize when we're talking about messiness and contradictions, especially with regards to minorities, we can't, uh, how we portray relationships and how we portray, you know, um, British South Asian men, it's, it's so, it, you have to be very careful, I think. So obviously Kiran was not resentful towards her husband for working long hours and instead acknowledged the harsh financial realities that not only required him to work such arduous hours, but also necessitated that she work, take up this part-time work. And within this current capitalist structure, her family had become quite exhausted and rightly so in that she was acting as a de facto single parent, but she was disproportionately carrying out um, physical care as well as contributing financially towards the running of the household. She was performing what Horschild and uh, Mishung term as the second shift, one shift at home and the second shift um, at um, uh, one shift at work, sorry, and the second shift at home. And this denotes being active in labor market whilst continuously performing all or most of the housework um, and childcare. This is not necessarily an outcome directly born out of household patriarchy, but rather has trickled down from wider patriarchal cap capital structures that depend on women contributing unpaid physical labor. The same structures ensure that her husband is paid more whilst also insinuating that she would be better paid to be a home carer, placed to be a home carer. One aspect that the literature on the second uh, shift overlooks is how intersectionality affects the choices of mothers like Kiran and Maria. An obvious ex exclusion is how um, second shift affects families caring for disabled children, as well as the lack of recognition of um, job insecurity when one is uh, from a minority community. So Maria's husband who's a taxi driver, his work-life balance as a taxi driver, his labor is structured by, um, in such a way for him that it reproduces that gendered care at home. Kiran and Maria's husbands cannot just quit their jobs if they want, even if they want to foster more egalitarian and uh, um, values and practices at home, even if they want to foster egalitarian um, parenting values at home. Men and women from minoritized communities have less fluidity and agency to move around the UK labor market for fear of facing uh, potentially longer periods of unemployment and financial straits because of institutional racism and xenophobia. So I think here that uh, religious and cultural communities do have a role to play um, and, and, and the state does, but you know, I hear I'm being a bit cynical about the role that state can play, but I think they do have a role to play towards providing that kind of support for the families, but also challenging you know, these problematic notions around caregiving. A third related stand to this talk is how um, children and young people's gender and sexual rights need to be addressed within religious context. Um, now conversations within uh, with children and adolescents about sexual rights and sexuality can be an awkward uh, topic for all parents across different communities. It is difficult because it entails negotiating personal boundaries and contextualized against a broader background of trans, uh, transnational marriages, handling care, family values, historical, cultural, religious values. And when these conversations are held at the intersection of disability, the situation becomes more complicated because there is a particular oppressive history attached to viewing disabled individuals as being asexual and in need of surveillance and protection for their own good, as many disabled academics like Tom Shakespeare and Jenny Morris have highlighted. So this is underpinned by a deep infantilizing and ableist notion that disabled children are forever um, pure, innocent, and in, in Urdu you would say masum, incapable. Uh, disinterested in exploring their sexual identities. And it is reasonable to assume that able-bodied children and adolescents will receive greater agency in, in uh, setting the boundaries for themselves in these conversations, as well as in exercising their sexual and gender rights because they have the privilege to control which aspects of their sexuality uh, remain invisible and which aspects they want to make it visible for their parents for their approval. Think about it, I mean, a lot of able-bodied children can have the privilege to get away uh, or sort of invisibilize their sexual or gender uh, experiences in front of their parents. Um, 
even with those rules firmly embedded in, in the same households that have disabled siblings, um, but disabled children um, have this added paternalistic and infantilizing lens imposed on, on their experiences. So um, also the other thing to remember is that, you know, when we talk about, uh, we had conversations around sex education and we had conversations around the role of talking about difficult subjects. So mainstream Islam does not explicitly prohibit sex education. However, the religious interpretations within a cultural context of most mothers in the current study disapproved of exposing their child to sex education. And this indicates that religious and sexual rights are both enacted within uh, a cultural framework. This is a quote by Maria. Um, it starts with, they're going to teach them about sex education and I laughed. How are you going to teach them? What will you tell them? Because of our culture and our religion, their norm and our norm are very different. We don't explain half the things to our children that white people do. They probably know from the very early age, but we keep it hidden from our children for as long as we can. Girlfriends and boyfriends, gays and lesbians, it's not allowed in our religion. We teach them that. It's not the norm and I have to respect that." End quote. So it is entirely plausible that many able-bodied cis Muslim young people are able to hide their sexual experiences from their parents and escape any type of reprimand uh, and atonement for breaking this implicit religious rule. However, for disabled Muslim young people um, who might have different sexual orientations, this privilege may, is not available, resulting in them being chastised or possibly disciplined more often for their sexual practices. So again, the concept of sexual rights, jurisprudence, you know, any kind of ruling with regards to sexual rights and gender rights have to be um, have to be developed and move forward with the inclusion of uh, the voices of disabled Muslims in uh, living in UK. Um, a related issue to this is, uh, and that one that I want to cover is also that how mothers address mar marriage prospects for the disabled children. And I found this really interesting because despite the lack of formal structural support, mothers were quite resistant to finding life partners that took over their caring responsibilities for their children. Now, this is quite an interesting point for me because within South Asian communities, and in fact, other minoritized communities, we do embody collectivist family values that are often critiqued and demonized by a lot of Western scholars as antithetical to concepts of individual freedom and agency. And yet, uh, how caregiving operates in, in, in wider South Asian extended families might just be the anti-capitalist resolution for surviving in austerity uh, if patriarchy uh, is addressed in the performance of care. When I did talk to mothers, they were concerned about um, upholding the dignity and rights of their disabled children in this regard. They did not want their child to be perceived as a burden by a potential spouse. Although they recognized that caregiving was a significant aspect of their um, child's uh, disability, they perceived that they were, uh, there was more to their child's life, personality, their overall experiences. They also understood that unpaid care was not, um, they also understood that unpaid care um, not supplemented with state formal care and form of care assistance, for instance, can lead to resentment and possible breakdown in, in relationships. So whilst they did aspire for their children to have fulfilling lives, they knew that marriage as, as one such institution could not, you know, could prevent their children from becoming very happy individuals. I think this view existed partly because some mothers that I interviewed uh, themselves had been in that position through transnational marriages where they got married to a disabled individual without their formal knowledge and where they got married, um, you know, and other, and they knew other women or they knew other women in their community or family circle who were married to a disabled extended um, relative to resolve issues of care. So yes, we see this today, even that, you know, in, in British, diasporic communities in order to maintain roots with Pakistan through you know, transnational marriages, women become that bridge that foster connections between back home and here in the UK. Women become that bridge to, to resolve issues around care. And, and again, you have to think about how this is situated in a, in, a, in a 
welfare society that has experienced massive cuts um, in the last 10 to 12 years um, with regards to voluntary and voluntary organizations, with regards to you know, how care can be provided by the state. So women ultimately and minority women ultimately become um, subject to, to the worst you know, um, kind of consequence of shouldering um, responsibilities for their families in that, in that respect. Um, so I would like to come to a close with, with, the, with my discussion, uh, but I, I want to encourage my audience, today's audience, to think about the following questions, uh, which is, what does it mean to be a Muslim in a non-able-bodied way? How do we ensure care is carried out in family in a non-paternalistic patriarchal way? And how can we ensure that sexual and gender rights are respected whilst ensuring that we are also protecting Muslim parenting practices safe, you know, they're safe from public scrutiny. Um, I, I hope these questions, you know, encourage people to, to reflect in, in, in words as well, as well as, uh, you know, ask and think about them as messy because they do magnify contradictions. And it is okay, I think, in some sense, um, because if you want to establish inclusive ways of, you know, being, then, then you have to address the messiness um, that already exists. So with that, um, I think I'm finished. Thank you.